Welcome to Epilogue, the only show that cuts into the big issues behind the best books on politics and world affairs. I'm Derek Conway and this week we're reviewing Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World by William D. Cohen. In today's epilogue we'll review the book and the issues around it, but before we get right into the discussion and I introduce our studio guests, let's take a look at this brief introductory video. In Money and Power, the author William D. Cohen peers behind the curtain to give us the inside story of why Goldman Sachs is so profitable and powerful. Uh, Cohen is the first yeah, author to chronicle and to interview the leaders of Goldman Sachs since the 2008 crash and has gained unprecedented access to the firm's inner circle. The book reveals Goldman Sachs as a secretive money-making machine that has walked an uneasy line between conflict of interest and legitimate deal-making for decades, a firm that has assiduously cultivated power and exerted its influence over government to the extent that Sidney Weinberg, who ran the firm for nearly 40 years, advised American presidents from Roosevelt to Kennedy. It's a company kept in line by former CIA operatives and private investigators and a workplace rife with brutal power struggles. In Money and Power, the author refers to Goldman Sachs as a symbol of immutable global power and unparalleled connections, which Goldman is shameless in exploiting for its own benefit, with little concern for how its success affects the rest of us. Today in Epilogue, we will review the book Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, by William D. Cohen. Of the thousands of banks that make global finance tick, few are as big, rich and politically powerful as Goldman Sachs, which for decades has combined high finance with political muscle. Even in the darkest days of financial world chaos, Goldman Sachs managed not only to survive, but prosper. Is it just ruthless ability, or is there a murkier side to this American colossus? The author, William D. Cohen, is an award-winning journalist and Wall Street veteran who has acquired a reputation for fearless financial investigative journalism. And to review his book, I'm joined in the Press TV studios by two excellent experts, David Pidcock, machinery consultant and writer who gives lectures on Islamic economics and is a co-founder of the National Association for Victims of Fraud and Banking Malpractice, and James Meadway, a senior economist at the New Economics Foundation, who recently was a senior policy advisor at the Royal Society and is currently working on a PhD on financial markets at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Welcome to you both. Yeah, thank you. This is a bit of a brick to carry around. Yes, it is. Um, and you will have understood every page of it where it was all a magic and mystery to me. But what did you make of it, James? Was well, it interesting? Well, it's, it's, it's extremely thorough. I mean, obviously, you can see the size of the thing. It's very, very thorough, very detailed uh, narrative history of, of Goldman Sachs, where it started and, and how it's come to be today. Uh, and very, very good in parts, I think. Some of the descriptions of some of the, the more complex bits that they, they've got up to recently, the way that synthetic CDOs work and, and all the kind of financial trickery really that's been taking place over the last few years. Some of that description I think is very, very good as a, a kind of guide to what was going on. Um, where it starts to be a bit weaker, I think, is it slightly lacks a, a kind of conclusion. It lacks a, a feeling that, well, this is what's going on in the world. This is our understanding of how, how the system operates. This is how Goldman Sachs really does end up being, you know, the, the biggest kid left standing. I mean, in part, of course, this, this, is, this is the nature of the, of the beast that, that you're up against. That It's not just about Goldman Sachs in the end. This is an entire financial system that's a problem. And Goldman Sachs just happens to be the bank that, you know, was left standing after, after the last crisis. Lehman Brothers collapsed, Bear Stearns swallowed up. Big investment banks that people would have thought would be around for decades more suddenly disappearing overnight. Goldman's still there. And this gives it the impression, I think, of, of a success or a magic about it that perhaps it doesn't really have. So maybe what comes through in his retelling of this story is that perhaps it's not so much that Goldman's doing anything special, it's that it just happened to be slightly better than everyone mm. else. It happened to be slightly the right place at the right time. Right, right time. What did you make of it, David? Well, I think very much along the lines that James is mentioning. Uh, from my standpoint, I, you know, this is a, an area that I've spent many years to, uh, actually, uh, actually doing the editing of this book, The Crash, which, which was, as carries, as carries, as studies the history of the abuse of money from Plato to NATO and beyond, basically. But uh, you can see the same problems throughout history. Uh, what what um, I think with, with uh, Goldman Sachs, when you look at their, the, the groups that are, they've got Robert Rubin and the people who are actually in positions of power, if you're the head of the Fed and you're the head of the Treasury and you're the main advisors behind presidents, I mean, if you're the captain on the ship, the ship is going where you're telling it to go. 
And, uh, but it's, it's the, the problem is that um, the system, in the Federal Reserve, the whole system, is a fraudulent system. And then it was condemned by many senators. The House Banking Committee report in 1964 says the Federal Reserve is the greatest threat to our democracy. Now, this is a government body warning about the system. And well, then, five years ago, yeah. Yes, but well, in 64. But you go then, and even you go through all the way back to when they founded the Federal Reserve. Uh, Henry Goldman made sure that the Federal Reserve of New York was the most powerful of the whole, uh, the, the 12 uh, banks, but all of them are private. The Federal Reserve, Bank of England, even the Central Bank of Sudan is controlled by the Federal Reserve of New York. Now, most people don't know that. Yeah. So, Goldman Sachs uh, is, is the last player, or the big player, but uh, the system is one. It's one complete uh, system, and there are some winners and losers, but they're never, they're never losing the way that the, pe the real economy is suffering because of these gamblers. And uh, as Milton Friedman uh, said at his, uh, in his, um, birth at his birthday party, and Bernard Bernanke admitted that the Federal Reserve caused the crash, and it was engineered by them and prolonged by them, uh, so uh, uh, the Goldman Sachs and the, all the other players are part of this cabal. The Federal Reserve is the, is the center of the spider's hub, and these are all players. And they bail them out, as the Bank of England we bailed out uh, many, many times, the lender of last resort, even hearing Marx's evidence given in 1857. You see the same, yeah. almost the dialogue is the same as it is today. Same always. It's the same But problem. I think it's, it's, it's interesting way, James, that Goldman Sachs, as you say, were as exposed as all the other banks when the crash came in 2008 because of obviously the problems with mortgage collateral. But it looked as if, from my reading of the book, and I may have misunderstood this, that they weren't actually holding any bad mortgages themselves. They were, they were effectively gambling on which ones would be the good mortgage. So you might as well have been putting it on a horse. I mean, it was, I hadn't realised that there was no collateral involved. It was purely a, a guess right. on what That's was right. going to happen. I mean, this is the and yet the, involving billions I of know, pounds. It's quite extraordinary. The, the, you know, they think that roughly what happened was that the mortgage market, the subprime mortgage market in the US began to collapse from 2006 onwards. But from that time, you know, certainly by, by the end of the 2000s, precisely because of the, the deregulation that Rubin and others had, had pushed earlier, banks had just been you know, running mad getting high in their own supply rather. I mean the synthetic collateralized debt obligations, which is what you're referring yeah. to here, these collections of not even mortgages, but bets on mortgages that you can then stack up and stack up forevermore. I mean you, this is it's not quite creating money out of nothing, but it's getting dangerously close to that. And of course the whole thing then disintegrates over 2007, 2008. You can't simply sort of print money forevermore. You can't just create debt forevermore. At some point those claims have to be uh, realized. Now the impressive thing in some ways with Goldman Sachs is that they move slightly faster on this. I think it's clear from the book that they were just a little bit quicker. They were ahead of the game in, I think, seeing the crash coming. But were they to ahead of the game, the David, because the they in. were just super bright, or were they no, ahead no, of the they, game because they had enough people their, in the uh, system? It was their but, system of trading. Yeah. And uh, the, the Russian guy who was arrested because he'd stolen their, their, their device, basically. So they were able to crash the market. But remember, Gordon Brown in 2004, now this is long before the crash, warned the cabinet and David Blunkett's diaries gave the game away. And I've questioned David Blunkett in public, he refuses to answer. This is the former f Home Secretary who was... Um, former Home Secretary. They government. say when yeah. you got home you were likely to find him at home. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, the point was that in 2004 July, his diaries show that Gordon Brown came to the special uh, cabinet review of, and he was saying how that, and warned them that how th bad things were going to become towards the end of 2008 and it's exactly in the time frame mm -hmm. and that they should start to get their house in order in preparation for that and, Gro and David Blunkett said that I, I put my hand on his shoulder and said I'm amazed that you would want to still be Chancellor while this thing is going on and he said there was deathly silence and then everybody started to laugh yeah. and then Tony Blair after he said only you could have got away with that yeah. but the point was 2004 Gordon Brown knew what was coming because so it's all part, absolutely, it's all engineered. Because it sort of started in Britain with Milton no, Rock. Well, look, I've got to show, show you that. This is, this is Milton Friedman said, look, yeah. 
The Federal Reserve definitely caused the Great Depression by contracting the amount of currency in circulation by one third from 1929 to 33. That's, that's, that's an arguable point. I mean, that's not, there's a but huge Bernard, academic Bernard debate. Bernard Bernanke, about what then caused. at his 90th birthday, yeah, admits. Yes, Bernanke agrees yes, with Friedman. They're it. both on the same we side did. of it. He's a head of the Reserve. There are other explanations for Tell me why what. the Great Depression happened. You can yeah. go through it. You can go through a kind of Keynesian argument. The yeah. argument that this is uh, overinvestment leading to a collapse in demand, leading to a failure in the real economy, which then but the real issue that came to raise this is, is a monetary argument. This is about saying it's the shrinking of the money supply yeah. that prolongs a great depression. Well, what are people short but about that's not, there? That's not They're necessarily short of money, the, aren't the, they? the thing that Keynes said. Place. What we're advocating spells the euthanasia of the rentier. Yeah. Now Bernanke and all these guys are rentiers. They rent yes. money. Yeah. They should have their hands chopped off. They should lose their heads because the system is destructive. It destroys everything, and look, war is the, inevitable. Look at the sort of the, the focus of the book, obviously, rather than the sort of wider mm. e e economics of it all. One of the things this firm seems to have been very good at, clever at, foresight, whatever you may say, is, is moving very senior executives into government. Well, yes. So they get close to presidential campaigns, mo most often Democratic, mm -hmm. but they seem to be able to get on with most people, but they are very close to the Democratic Party. Were, were other banks doing that, or was, this a, was that a Goldman way of operating to make sure they had people in high places who were brought up in their stable and would maybe just look after their interests if ever needed? Well, I mean, every bank wants to get people that it knows and trusts and likes it in power. This is part of the part of the operation of running any large corporation. Yeah. That, that's why, you know, we see today that, that various lobbying firms have been bragging, was it Bell Pottinger, bragging uh, about how they can influence government and they'll do that on behalf of their clients. Now Goldman does appear to be more successful about this. If you if you look just in Europe at the moment, you know, with the appointment of you know, Mario Monti as Italian Prime Minister, uh, Papademos as Prime Minister of Greece, you know, both former Goldman employees, both quite senior actually as it happens. You can get carried away I think by how much of this is, is deliberate. I suspect what you're looking at here is that you have a very large, uh, very influential, very rich uh, private sector institution that tends to attract a certain group of people into it which is you know people who are ambitious and clever and all the rest of it and they end up moving on elsewhere in life and that I think is, is the process you're looking at. It's because Goldman is a very very large corporation that it's able well, to, to act well, like clearly, this. Clearly it, it, it works for Goldman Sachs because they have many former employees who are in indeed friends in high places so that when the trouble really hit in 2008 and they needed their friends this is what the author reports actually happened Goldman's recent public relations nightmares began in earnest in March 2009 when the firm appeared at the top of the list of counterparties that had received billions of dollars in payments funneled through AIG by the US government as part of the second phase of the 2008 $182 billion bailout of AIG, the counterparty list had been kept secret for months and was only released after much public outcry. A narrative quickly developed in the zeitgeist that Goldman had somehow received a special benefit, along with its $14 billion thanks to its numerous Washington connections. What I thought was interesting about that uh, extract is that, of course, these billions that the American government was giving their banks, that the pounds that the British governments were giving yeah. British banks, of course that's not the government's money, it's not the politicians' money, it's, it's tax dollars, it's tax pounds, it's the, the people's money being given on an enormous scale. And I would have thought, David, this is clearly down to political influence, isn't it? I mean, if, if a banker had no political influence, why would a government do it? Well, precisely. Uh, and and uh, uh, if you, Jefferson, uh, basically, if you read all the president, if you read Jefferson's accounts of the banks, the problems, this has been a known problem. But look, the problem of the, the book begins here. It actually begins in Chesterfield in, in 1688 when the plan was to bring the Amsterdam bankers here. It, we were Amsterdam. The Bank of England is set up in 1694 with a debt to William or levied on the British people at 8% till the Day of Judgment. Now that has compounded to the fact we'll be paying maybe 70 to 80 billion in tribute and interest on a debt that should have died and should never have been created in the first place because the, the Treasury should issue all the money. We shouldn't be borrowing a penny at, at interest from anybody and that's been a known problem for thousands of years. In the, the reign of Sulla, in the Emperor, 80,000 usurers and bankers were, were executed and they had a nove tabula, which is what's needed, a clean, debt, a clean slate for all. Because unless you cancel debt, war and, and the meltdown of society will come and, and you can't avoid it. 
That's quite uh, apop apocalyptic. Uh, yes. well, James, what do you make about the, the, the political influence that Goldman Sachs were wielding during this very critical time for them? They managed to get more than anybody else out of the pot. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's the same with, I think, other banks as well. That, 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 you know, you're looking at a systemic crisis here. You're looking at something that affects every single bank. All of them take a hit, and then there's a desperate scrabble to be the people who get the, the slice of the, of the government pie at the end of it. Now, I mean, there, there are extraordinary stories about this. The, the one part of it, perhaps, it's political political influence, perhaps it's the ability to have a quiet word with your pals in government who you've developed over many years at, uh, at this point. The other part of it, of course, is a simple, I think, a, a kind of blackmail. If you read uh, Sandra Rawnsley's account of uh, you know, the years of Gordon Brown being in office, where shortly after uh, Lehman Brothers filed for, for bankruptcy, so Sunday afterwards, the heads of the major British banks come in to meet Alistair Darling and basically say, uh, look, if we're not given a bailout, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, if we're not given some support, then on Monday morning we'll close all our branches, all the ATMs will shut, there's a massive run developing on the banking system, we have to get the money. So that, that I think is a real sort of panic that's also coming in there. And, and to an extent a kind of blackmail. The, the, you go, the, these people come in and say, well, the only option is, well, we just have to shut up shop. Now, actually, what the government could have done at that point is say, well, OK, we, we can assist you, uh, but we're going to do this by making sure that your investors take the hits, not yeah. taxpayers. We're going to nationalise a lot of you, yeah. and we're going to run them for, for the public interest. Mm -hmm. That would have been one option at the time. It's not the one taken, because instead you get these enormous bailouts of, of private sector risk. For, for the, I mean, uh, as Cohen makes clear in his book, the, the link between Goldman Sachs and, and, and the White House, particularly on the yeah. financial side, but did, did, did it extend to foreign policy as well? I mean, obviously, yeah. Goldman Sachs got well, strong links with... Uh, all, well, all of them. I mean, wherever you've got people, even in, in Nigeria, where you have the, say, the finance minister yeah. is a, a member of Goldman Sachs, and wherever you go, you find the placement, and this is what, what all good businessmen do. They try and get people in, in, in positions of influence. But... The, the problem um, that we're seeing, or we've seen, is exactly what happened when the Bank Charter Act failed. All the way the, with the lender of last resort has been the people, rather than stopping borrowing. And uh, st I mean, the Federal Reserve was the great tra tragedy for America. The Bank of England was the great tragedy for us. No government should borrow. It should create the money, and you would never have this problem. And when they say, we're going to close the ATMs, it won't, well, you have to go to jail. But we'll put them in prison because they are the criminals. The criminal cabal in the city has been the biggest criminal entity in the history of mankind. It, it's, I mean, it's curious that there have been no prosecutions that no. are aware of in America or, or no. in, in Britain as There's a result a of the, very the, the collapse. Players, I mean, really. Obviously, I mean, Madoff went to jail, yeah, but that was, yeah. Yeah, that was exactly. a crime, crime yeah, rather quite, than... Quite obviously. Whereas, so. so everybody just argues there's some misjudgments on a billion dollars. It's clear scale. in this that all the time they play by the rules of the game, more or less. Yeah. I mean, occasional investigations and this sort of thing. It's the same with yeah. the other banks. They can all hold up their hands and say, well, we're, we're playing by the rules. Uh, and unfortunately, the rules are incredibly lax, so no one gets prosecuted. Yeah. No, no, and yes, of course, and they have their own hand in making sure that they're So where, where does relaxed. transparency come into all this? Because if you've got senior bankers moving into the White House administration in and out, if you've got bankers, it doesn't seem to happen as, as commonly in, in Britain, but it seems very much part of the American yeah. system. Where does the transparency for the American public come in all this? How do they know what's going on with their tax dollars? It's all a big secret all the time, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think fa fairly bluntly that there's a, an awful lot of deliberate obfuscation about what's been taking place. I mean, so why doesn't Congress do more about this? Well, is it because um, too many are having their, their campaign funds? Whoever tra challenges, Jesus walks on water, feeds the 5,000 to the applause of everybody. Only when he touched the money changers in the temple did he find himself in serious difficulty. Whoever's challenged the system throughout history, you will find with Lincoln, uh, with Madison, presidents were assassinated three days after Lincoln introduced his greenback dollar, the, the, the 17 points, he was assassinated. As soon as Kennedy, five months after he reintroduced it, He's assassinated, and, who, and, they, and so the politicians know. Only Mahathir in Malaysia had the courage to say when the IMF came, IMF stands for Infant Mortality Fund, uh, wherever you go. Mahathir did exactly, I took him a five-point plan developed by James Gibbs Stewart, the Forum for Stable Currencies, and he implemented the five-point plan, and within three days, everybody crashed except Malaysia. So when has the their political influence diminished now as a result well, this, of this all is, the, the I think this is an interesting case in point. The, yep. the, the crash in East Asia in, at the end of the 90s, which Malaysia did relatively better out of precisely because they, they told the IMF where to go, has led to, I think, a real, or it's helped lead to a real shift of policy and the way that countries, particularly in the South, now think about how they might run their economies. You're looking at 
potentially a real weakening of the influence of the IMF and certainly yeah. a weakening of the influence of large American banks like Goldman Sachs. So the rise of countries like Brazil and China is directly a threat to the power of, of American capital. Well, I mean, the, bankers might still be doing very well financially with bonuses and things, but on the whole, it's not an occupation that the press and well, the public are saying, oh, these wonderful people, aren't they saints no, walking the, on the, the earth? Lord so Stamp was... Uh, uh, was the one who was the chairman of Miller Bank, and he said banking was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. Yeah. Bankers own the earth, give them, take away the, their power to create credit, but with a flick of the pen they will create enough to buy it all back again. So if you wish to remain slaves of bankers, continue to them, allow them to con con create money. At, at but is their influence still as great, David, as before the crash? Well, it was, it is, it's not, as, it, it's not as great as it was before the internet. People now yeah. on the street actually real, the, the, the clarity Faith, hope, and clarity, that's what we want, is actually to see now what's going on. They can see it for, the, for themselves. But Do you think this will curtail oh, I th I the, think the risk that I the think, bankers take? I think that. that this is the beginning of the end for them. I do, uh, yeah. seriously, because uh, the people I'm talking to now, people that, that 20 years ago when we were starting talking about this, they thought we were, we were lunatics. But after Mahathir's success, and uh, he did that within three days. In China, uh, the 2007, I took this book and my seminar for the founder of the, st uh, the stock exchange in China, Mr. Dai. Within three days, all the stuff I took was translated into Chinese and everybody who was anybody. Now, on the day we were giving the seminar, uh, Mr. Green, who was chairman of uh, HSBC at the time, came for lunch to, with Mr. Dai. And Mr. Mr. Dai asked him what he thought about what I was saying, basically. And he said, well, off the record, I have to agree, but don't quote me. That was him. But basically, there is a, an end game, and I think we're seeing the beginning of that now. And do you, and do you think that, James? Do you think well, we're seeing a... It's a possibility. I mean, I think <laughs> things like the Occupy Wall Street movement, the, the people down at St. Paul's, the, there's a real kind of uh, did, sense I mean, of public revulsion We're talking about sort of dozens of people out of millions, because yeah, we're once people understand, people say, that their by, pension yeah, funds are at risk... Of, I mean, uh, it's, it's all right when it's a sort of demonstration that doesn't affect you, but when you actually then say to people, your pension fund's gone as well, isn't well, that when the public opinion will start to... There's certainly a serious risk at the moment for this country, which has a very, very large, yeah. uh, obviously, financial sector, and it's very, very much exposed to anything else that happens in the rest of the world, because it is so internationalised, so sort of spread out like that. Anything happening inside the European financial system, which is certainly very likely, a very, very high possibility at the moment, will immediately impact on Britain and spread pretty much everywhere else. Now, that could then get us into another situation where, once again, the banks are all insisting on bailouts. Once again, we have a repeat of what happens well, yeah. in 2008. Well, we, could, we, we, we need a, a lot more time to, to cover <laughs> such a big issue but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this is a fascinating book for those who want to see behind the PR machine that protects global blanking from the glare of public examination how desirable it is to have high finance and politics intermingle at such high levels and with such interdependency makes a mockery of democracy even in America where financial and political corruption are endemic this book will make you pause for thought I'd like to thank David and James for joining us, and I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you have a book you'd like the program to review, we'd like you to keep getting in touch, and here's how. Epilogue wants to interact with you. You can get in touch by emailing us at epilogue at presstv.co.uk, join our Facebook page at Epilogue on Press TV, where you can suggest new books to review, watch past episodes, and leave your comments. Keep your feedback coming, and until the next epilogue, thanks for watching. <laughs>